Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about a book called Good to Be King. It's the foundation of our constitutional freedom, and this book started out in the brainchild of our guest who started studying the Constitution in 1983 while managing the Braidwood Nuclear Simulator Project. The book began formulation as he began running for the Libertarian Party in 2003, and it was also marked with the forward by Ron Paul, Republican of Texas, known for his integrity and independent views, wrote the forward, as I said. You're going to be pretty alarmed for the listeners out there who may think they understand and know what the Constitution is and what our rights are, but you'd be surprised at just how much this country has changed since the inception of our founding fathers and this document known as the Constitution. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 Radio program today our guest, Michael Badnarik. Michael, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 Radio program today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. You know, this was an interesting conversation because you can go out to most Americans and they have an idea about what the Constitution is and maybe about what some of our rights are, but they really don't know it as well as they think they do, as, as you were saying in your book. That, that's true. I, I give presentations frequently, and I'll ask people to raise their hand if they're good, patriotic American. Not surprisingly, everybody raises their hand. And it's okay, raise your hand if you can tell me how many articles are in the Constitution. And nobody's able to do that. Most people think they know what the Constitution says, but they really haven't read it. And, you know, my final question is always, well, hypothetically, if the government was doing something unconstitutional, how would you know? And, you know, real quickly you realize that you really wouldn't know until you study the document. I think it's really interesting because we learn about history in a particular way, especially for those of us who had attended public schools, government-funded schools for the most part, and all the hero worship we tend to get out of our textbooks. Then years later, as we grow into adults and we actually take an active interest in history, we begin discovering things that leave us scratching our heads and thinking to ourselves, have I been hoodwinked? <laughs> And the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> we, we've all been hoodwinked, uh, unfortunately. Now, as you teach about the Constitution, what surprises you from your classmates, the kind of, uh, I guess, interaction that you tend to get when it comes to learning about the Constitution? Well, you know, we are the good guys. Our flag is red, white, and blue. You know, the presumption that, well, we would never do anything wrong. And when they discover that, you know, evil people are everywhere and, you know, they are also, unfortunately, embodied in our Congress and, you know, all of our, uh, you know, levels of government. Um, I've actually had students crying during one of the coffee breaks because they realized just how corrupt that their government really was. And it was, it was just a shock to the system. Now, it gets to a point, too, and I think because I would say that our approval rating of our government is probably at an all-time low. We just don't believe we can do anything about the situation we're in. What do you say to somebody who has that sort of thinking? Well, it's not... It's not that we can't do anything about it. It's at the point where the things that we're going to have to do are unpleasant. And, you know, people don't want to take those final steps. You know, we're going to have to indict people and put them in jail for a long time. I mean, they are literally guilty of perjury and treason. You know, they've taken an oath to protect and defend the Constitution. Now, that's what the words say, but none of us expect, you know, the government agents to go to the National Archive and stand in front of this piece of parchment. I mean, it's, it's under nitrogen gas. We're taking really good care of the piece of paper, but we're not taking good care of the ideas that are listed on that piece of paper, and that's the problem. And, 
you know, once people start to read the Constitution, their first reaction is, well, that's not the way we do it. And I laugh. I go, yeah. So what are you telling me? You're telling me that government doesn't operate the way the Constitution says they're supposed to operate? Wouldn't that, by definition, be unconstitutional? And my class is just incredibly eye-opening. Um, people, it, it's an eight-hour class from 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. We take about an hour for lunch. And people show up and it's like, oh, my gosh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay awake all day. You know, this is a long time. And when we get to 6 p.m., I'm thanking them for coming and, you know, close, closing up the class. They go, well, you can't quit yet. You know, we've got a half a million questions we got to ask. And so typically what I do is I terminate the class because, you know, that was, you would usually have to get, you know, empty the room at the hotel or wherever. Uh, but then I go to a restaurant, and I always pick a restaurant that's got a, a back room where we can sit around and, you know, let people ask all the questions that they've suddenly come up with. Um I, I have a challenge that I give all my students. I, I tell them that I can answer questions about the Constitution longer than you can ask. And uh, at one location, my students kept me awake until 2 o'clock in the morning. It was eight hours of questions after an eight-hour day of class. So apparently... You know, the information that I was providing them hit a nerve. I mean, and they were in, incredibly enthusiastic about finding out more, finding out what we can do to protect the the spirit of this country. I mean, we go to Fourth of July parades, we light fireworks, we have picnics, and, you know, I don't know that you'd ever find anybody who, would openly say they don't love the United States. But what they're really saying is they love the ideology, the, the way we've pictured the United States all these years, the way we learned about it in school with, as you say, all of these heroes. But when you find out that that's not the way things work today, when you find out that you know the, the people in Washington are not your heroes, it's a little bit traumatic. And uh, and people do genuinely love the freedom, and they want to fix it. I know that I first had an eye-opener uh, some years ago where I had picked up, it was a series, I believe it was four parts, it was called The Century of Self. And what this really was was a documentary in four parts about the rise of propaganda, Edward Bernays, how he came to learn his techniques, what it was all about. And I realized, well, I can see big business using this effectively, but when our government tries to use something like this, it looks so sloppy. They're getting better at it, but it's taken decades. But the point being is, as you can come to understand this, you begin to see through the nonsense that they try to pass on and make us believe. Now, one of the interesting things as uh, we begin to dive into your book here, uh, Good to be King, is that the Constitution started out or is about us having the ability to own property, you know, something that's really ours that we can do with what we want, much as what the King of England used to do. <laughs> and it's interesting to think that here was the king that whenever he wanted to pass a law or enact some sort of, call it legislation for lack of a better word, he just had to pen it out and there it was. And I don't see how that's any different today with President Obama, George W. Bush, or even Bill Clinton, for instance. And everybody's beginning to see that it really doesn't matter who's in office. They're continuing to do the same things they've done for decades. And it even goes back, as you say in your book, as far back as Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it was, probably goes back further than that. But, yes, you know, the reason that most people don't see the problem is because it's been so gradual. You know, they've managed to, you know, pass a law here, pass a law there, and we kind of go along with it, 
because, you know, we're busy living our lives and, you know, really, quite frankly, don't want to waste too much time. We voted for people. We assume that they're in Washington doing what they're supposed to do. You know, and the the other assumption is, well, if they got elected, you know, they must know the Constitution. They, you know, they wouldn't they wouldn't be evil if they were in Washington. And and this is kind of a human psychology problem. We always judge other people based on what we know about ourselves. And, you know, most people are good and honest. They would never lie. They would never deliberately take advantage of somebody else. And so we judge other people the way that we think we are. And that's why we give our politicians so much slack. It's like, well, I'm a good person, and I know I know that my people in Washington would, you know, also be a good person. And the truth is they're not. Most of what the government does is based on fraud. They they lie, they cheat, they steal, and it's it's unnerving. As I said earlier, I've had uh, students crying in class when they realize just how corrupt the the government is actually is. Now, going to property rights, this is a, an interesting place for us to start here. Is I was kind of, it was an eye-opener when you talk about motor vehicles, when you talk about licensing and permits. Talk about that a little bit, because I was actually quite surprised what you were sharing, especially when it comes to somebody having a car. Well, again, most of what the government does is based on fraud. And, you know, if we go along with it and don't challenge the ideas, then, you know, there doesn't appear appear to be a problem. But, you know, whenever you buy a home, you know, the first person you call, typically, is a real estate agent. And it turns out that when you purchase real estate, you purchase everything from the grass, the grass, the bushes, the house, the garage, and, and it's really like a 99-year lease. You don't own the property. I mean, if you try to put up an oil derrick in your backyard, it's not going to be long before the sheriff is out there going, you're in a heap of trouble, boy. You can't do that. And, I mean, if you can't do things with your property, then legally you don't own it. Um, but with cars... If I give you a gift certificate, do you have the gift or do you have a piece of paper that represents the gift? I mean, you may you may have a piece of paper that says that, you know, you have a one-week vacation in Hawaii. But until you go to the um, travel agency and convert that piece of paper into plane tickets and, you know, a, you know, a Hawaiian pineapple, you don't have the actual vacation. So you go to the auto dealer, you, you know, start giving them money, you pay it off over time, and when you're done paying for the car, the government will send you a certificate of title. Well, if you have the certificate, of title. Do you have the title or just a piece of paper that represents the title? And since you can accomplish most of what you want with the certificate of title, you think you own the car. The truth is you don't. You're only in possession of the car and the uh, the state where you live is holding the original title, which is known as the um, MSO, the Manufacturer's Statement of Origin. And it's difficult, almost impossible, to purchase an automobile and acquire the MSO because, you know, the auto dealers are in cahoots with the state. However, it is difficult, but it's not impossible. 
And uh, I know a couple people who have, you know, basically thrown a small tantrum. You know, they have all this cash, you know, in their hand. And, you know, fortunately for greed, the auto dealer wants to sell the car badly enough that they may, on occasion, sell you the car along with the the legal title, the manufacturer's statement of origin. And, you know, this sounds like Alice in Wonderland. I, I'm fully aware of that. Uh, your listeners may think that I've uh, had too much to drink before I came on the air. But you get a copy of my book, and I have photocopies of, you know, what a manufacturer's statement of origin looks like. Now, the reason I wanted to bring that up is because of how we're abided by the laws when it comes to driving a car. And as you had pointed out in your book, well, that depends on if you're driving it for profit. You know, are you a bus driver, a cab driver, somebody who, you know, hauls food, for instance, whatever the case is, you're actually driving because you're doing that uh, for an income. Now, that's much different than somebody who, for instance, just wants to go to the store or maybe go to the woods for a camping trip. Now, I wanted to bring that up because actually here in this state, I live in the state of Oregon, uh, it was about probably eight years ago, uh, I had ran into an acquaintance through a friend of mine who was actually fighting the state of Oregon. He says, there is a law in the state of Oregon that says this, you can have a car, you can drive your car, you don't have to have a driver's license, you don't even have to register the car unless you're planning to use it you know, as a business for profit. And, and, and that's what you abide by is the laws that govern around that license. Now, what was interesting about that is people are like, really? You mean to tell me that I can actually drive my car and I'm not really bound by the laws of what the license bounds me by? And he says, absolutely right. He had actually been thrown in jail I don't know how many times. I don't know how many times he was checked out or at least detained when he was at the DMV for optional licensing. These are all things that are available to us right now. And it was just astounding. Here was the guy, you know, by the letter of the law, trying to implement his rights because of that law and the kind of adversity that he was facing as a result. Well, I I understand it completely. I have done the same thing myself. You know, the Declaration of Independence says that you can pursue happiness, but there's no real guarantee that you're going to achieve happiness. And, you know, you have to decide how badly you want your freedom. Um, You know, Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. I mean, and people quote that all the time. They go, oh, gosh, isn't that clever? They've got bumper stickers and T-shirts, but I don't think they really stop to consider what that really means. You know, for liberty or death. And so people say, well, gosh, Michael, you know, you get thrown in jail and, oh, it's just so much of a hassle. You know, it would be easier to, you know, to get the driver's license and not fight the system. Well, it's true. It would be easier but it wouldn't be right. You know, I don't like anybody telling me what I have to do. And when I find out that this whole driver's license thing is really, has nothing to do with safety, nothing at all. It is all revenue generated for the government and the city. And, you know, they, I was going, I don't know, three miles an hour over the speed limit, and I had a police officer you know, headed the other direction, coming towards me. And he pulled a U-turn across like four lanes of traffic to come up behind me and pull me over. And I said, are you kidding? You think (laughs) that three miles an hour over the limit is more dangerous than that, you know, total U-turn that you did just disrupting all this traffic? You know, you're almost killing people trying to pull me over because your, you know, uh, radar gun said that I was going two miles an hour. It, it's absolutely ludicrous. It's all about revenue. And if if I'm going someplace to buy something and, okay, the price seems a little bit high, you know, it's like, okay, so, you know, it's expensive. But when I find out 
that it didn't have to be that expensive, that quite literally I was being ripped off, it, I don't care what the, how much money I lost. It, to me, it is a matter of principle. And I'm not going to just sit around and let somebody take money from me, not when I know that they've cheated. So, yes, it is difficult, um, but, you know, I'm a man of honor. I'm, I'm on a crusade. And when you discover how many other things the government does, which are all immoral, unconstitutional, and a violation of our right to property and freedom, you know, it, it gets a little bit irritating. And, and like I say, people take my class, and uh, before long, they want to do something about it. They don't want to just sit back and let the government continue to take advantage of them. I would say that in 2008, people felt hope because they felt that their vote had mattered as we brought in a new president. Everybody was enchanted, of course, because now here's our first black president. And I say, well, if you look back in history, you might rethink that. But the point is, in your book, you said that we, the citizens of the United States, actually don't vote for our president, that that's really based on electoral colleges. Describe that a little bit more for us. I happened to run for President of the United States in 2004. Um, I consider it a uh, youthful indiscretion. Uh, it would have to be with 25,000 miles under your feet. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, that was not a good idea, but I'm, I'm glad that it, it's over. However, when the Founding Fathers organized the Constitution, they deliberately wanted to put people in office using different methods. Um, House of Representatives was a direct popular vote. So that's where you personally are voting for the, the representative that's going to go to Washington and speak in your behalf. The senators were originally chosen by the state legislature. And the purpose of that was the state legislature would pick somebody, or actually two somebodies, whose job it was to limit federal power. This is a, one of those systems of checks and balances that we hear about, but you know, don't really understand. Um, we don't want, or at least at one time, we did not want the federal government getting too big. And so senators were chosen explicitly to go and veto anything that would give the federal government more power. Well, in 1917, we changed that system. And, you know, basically people were kind of conned. Like, well, you're smart enough to vote for representative, aren't you? Yeah. Well, why aren't you smart enough to vote for senators? You know, well, yeah, that makes sense. And so we changed that process. Well, people don't vote for senators, you know, who are going to limit government power. They just vote for the, the senator they like the most. And ever since 1917, the federal government has been growing almost exponentially. Um, for president... You have to understand that this was back in you know the 1700s. We didn't have the internet. We didn't even have telegraph at the time. And how are people in some of the western states going to express their their desire for a particular presidential candidate? Well, what we would do is we would pick electors, and I would say, you know, uh, we really trust you. You're a good guy and we're going to pay for your travel. We're going to send you on a two-week vacation to some place called Washington, D.C., and there's going to be a bunch of people, you know, asking for our vote for, you know, President of the United States. And your job is to look at all the candidates, vote for the person that you think is the best candidate, 
and then come back and tell us who you picked. And so that was the kind of origin of the Electoral College. And so what happens in a presidential election year, like, you know, right now, the Democrats, Republicans, the Libertarians, the Constitution Party, all the political parties are getting together. They're having their state conventions, and they are selecting the the favorite Republicans, the favorite Democrats, to potentially be on the Electoral College. And so then we wait for the vote in November. Now, in November, people are actually voting for the the electors in your state. But in Texas, we'd have 36 Democrats, 36 Republicans, 36 Libertarians, 36 Constitution Party. Your ballot would be five pages long just for president. And since you probably don't know the names of those people anyway, they abbreviate. And instead of putting the names of all of the electors, they put the name of the candidate, the presidential candidate for that party. So George Bush's name goes up for the Republicans, John Kerry's name goes up for the Democrats, and Michael Badnarik's name goes up for the Libertarians. And so I admit, people see my name, they put an X next to my name, and from their point of view, they voted for me. When in legal reality, what they did was vote for the um, electors, the libertarian electors in that state. So um, it, it's really kind of a, a technicality, but um, there's no point in changing that system until a larger percentage of Americans understand the important parts of the Constitution. Well, I thought that would be an interesting thing to bring up considering what had happened in the 2000 election where allegedly it was all about the state of Florida and the voters, you know, where their votes didn't count or they weren't able to cast their votes. And you realize, based on what you're saying, well, no, you're voting for the approval that somebody else has. It's not yours, it's somebody else's. And I thought, that's pretty astounding when you think how distracted we were about the fact that voters were angry because they didn't feel that their votes actually got in there and that there was actually ballot tampering, when in fact <laughs> that really doesn't seem to matter, does it? It really doesn't. You know, it's, you know, metaphorically, you know, if the house has burned down and it's laying on the ground smoking and the, you know, firemen are there putting water on whatever is left smoking, you're going, oh, my God, I have a broken window. Well, yeah, <laughs> Yes, you do have a broken window, but that's not really your highest priority right now. I mean, the prob problem is much worse than a broken window. And so when people start to, you know, argue about, you know, whether Barack Obama is officially a citizen or whether the Electoral College should be allowed to, you know, it's like you're fighting over details. We got we got bigger problems than that. And you know, it's your your ignorance is showing when you're focusing on things that well really kinda of don't even matter. You know, and that's why I brought up about that uh series that I was talking about, the century of self, if people could understand and see what's going on, just as you said, they'd realize why am I bickering over details? Well, because you want to be distracted enough so these guys can go and do something else. The most successful thieves usually steal when they're standing right in front of you shaking your hand. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, they they gain your trust. You know, you, you, know, you stop worrying about whether they are going to rip you off or not. And, you know, and that, it's all about establishing trust. Um, you know, whenever you meet a stranger, you don't know if they're a friend or foe, you don't know if they're going to be good guy, bad guy, whether they're going to attempt to rip you off. And so you're nervous. You're nervous around strangers. But then they talk real nice, and 
you know, they're saying things that you like to hear, and what happens is that you mentally make a decision that, oh, this is a good person. You know, I trust this person. And then it's not your fault. I mean, it's just psychologically the way we work. Once you have established that friendship, you stop worrying about it. You know, you only pet search somebody once to see if they have any weapons. And then, you know, you don't find a gun the first time. You don't keep on pat searching them over and over and over again. But, you know, in certain cases, you really should because they may they may have hidden the gun for the first pat search. And, you know, as soon as you stop looking, you know, that's when they pick up a weapon and surprise you. So, you know, we take our, you know, representatives for granted. You know, we get all excited you know, every four years, we elect a president, and then we stop. We, we, we start worried about taking the kids to soccer practice. Um, you know, we've got, we've got to work for a pay raise, and our focus is definitely not on Washington, D.C. We, we usually have no idea what Congress is voting on until after it's over, after it's too late. So... We need to, we as a population, all the people in the United States, need to place a much higher priority on what the people in Washington are doing. And I'm telling you, if you take my class, you're going to discover that the people in Washington are not your friends. You know, they they are not raising taxes to make your life better. I mean... Who do you think is going to be spending all that money? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, so it's like, oh, good, they're raising my taxes again, and I'm going to get nothing. Well, I think what's interesting about that too is, I whenever that comes up for me, the memory always is of George W. Bush on national television as he's getting ready to go out of office after his eight-year tenure. And he says, we're asking the American people for $700 billion to bail us out of the situation we're in. And the first thing I thought is, you ain't asking us for a damn thing. You're telling us you're going to do this, and you're just hoping we'll just lend, you know, throw arms around you for support. And I thought, you know, when you take a look at that and, and how the, we were talking about voting earlier, you know, a lot of things that get done in Congress – usually get done under the radar, so to speak. And one of those things was a big thing when it was the creation of the Federal Reserve. Yes. Uh, I have to be really careful when I talk about the Federal Reserve. because That's why I should have brought E.B. Griffith on the program again. (laughs) Yeah. uh, He's he's wonderful. Um, If you want to talk about conspiracies, I mean, this is just like a James Bond movie where Goldfinger is trying to take control of the world. Now, the good news is that, you know, if it's Goldfinger, James Bond is going to save the day and, you know, he can't do anything wrong. And, you know, and it's all make-believe. The problem is that Congress is not make-believe. They really are. Well, in this case, it was... The, the bankers who decided that instead of competing against each other, they would work together as a, a team and, you know, basically form a cabal to control the, all the money in the United States. Now, if I don't have an apple, can I give it to you? And the answer is, well, no, I didn't have it in the first place. You know, what am I going to be handing you? And I'm just going to be holding my hand out. And it's like, tell that. Well, if you read the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5, says that Congress has the authority to coin money. Well, what would you coin money out of? Well, gold and silver, naturally. And... I can go through a lot more detail and proof, but Congress was never given the authority to print 
money. So they, they, Congress couldn't do it. So if Congress is not allowed to print money, how does Congress give a private organization called the Federal Reserve, who is not part of the federal government, um, Federal Express is not part of the federal government, but they've got the word federal in their name. So if Congress does not have the authority to print money themselves, how do they give that authority to a private company. You know, basically they gave the Federal Reserve a monopoly on counterfeiting. And the sad thing is that Article 1, Section 8, Clause 6, the next line in the Constitution, explicitly says that Congress is responsible for punishing people who are counterfeiting. <laughs> so, I mean, not only are they not allowed to do it in the first place, they were supposed to stop it. And and I'm staring, and it's like, oh, my God. I mean, how did we get this bad? And so people come to my class, and I say, most, most of what our government does is unconstitutional. And they go, oh, Michael, you know, you always exaggerate. You're always, you know, just pushing the envelope and using hyperbole just to try to impress us. No, no, this is not hyperbole. Most of what the government does is unconstitutional. I mean, are, are you okay with that? On a scale from zero to 100%, uh, on that scale... How much rape do you think we should tolerate? 5%, 10% only on Thursdays? No, the answer is zero. There is no no justifiable excuse for rape. It is evil, it's awful, and as long as I'm alive, it's like 0%. Okay? On a scale from zero to 100%, how much unconstitutional law do you think we should tolerate? 5%, 10%? How about if we get rid of just three of the Bill of Rights? Because, well, I mean, you don't really have anything to say. You don't need the First Amendment, do you? Not really. And and, and if we get rid of three or four of the Bill of Rights, it'll be easier for our children to memorize in these government indoctrination centers. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. And, you know, I don't like being the bearer of bad news. Um, However, you know, if the Titanic is sinking, I have a responsibility to run around and go, "Um, I think it's time for you to get off the boat, you know, because this is not the way things are supposed to be. So I'm doing my best to you know, warn my fellow Americans to bring people up to speed so that they can literally understand what the Constitution says and how the government is supposed to operate. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that that's that's not the way we are operating. But when you know how we're supposed to operate, you go, well, wait a minute. It's like, they can't do that. They go, well, yes, they can. They can do that if you're asleep and you allow it to happen. You know, if we're going to stop all of this treason, then the American people are going to have to get off the couch, turn off the TV, and they're going to have to do something a little bit more, well, permanent than vote. Bumper stickers, yard signs, uh, that's not going to solve the problem anymore. I'm, I'm really sorry to say. We need to learn the law. We need to apply the law. And and we need to indict people. We need to handcuff them, take them to court, you know, put them in jail. And I didn't know that it was wrong. is not an excuse. You know, I was just doing what I was told to do. No, that's not an excuse. It didn't work at Nuremberg, and it's not going to work now. 
you took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution that is my Constitution, that is my Bill of Rights, and you've been blatantly violating my individual rights and my right to property, and you think I'm just going to let you skate? No. No, this is this is punishable by long, long time in prison. Now, on your website, constitutionpreservation.org, I like this quote here, but it's interesting how I want to talk about this. Your quote is, if the First Amendment doesn't work, the Second Amendment will. Now, I couldn't help feeling and thinking about, as I was reading through your book, It's Good to Be King, um, that uh, the situation that happened in Waco, Texas, several years back. Most of us outside of Texas were hearing the jokes. But then I came across, some years after the event, a documentary called Waco, The Rules of Engagement. And anybody who sees that, I'm sure, would feel their blood boil. Now, in this situation, here was a group of people allegedly, you know, practicing their First Amendment right to freedom of religion. Now, that didn't work, so the Second Amendment will with the guns, and that's where the government comes in. Now, let's talk about that for a little bit, because I know that you also give that as uh, one of those reference points in your books. In your book, excuse me. What, uh, that, to me, was just astounding. Well, self-defense is fundamental. You know, if we stop and talk, so get, you know, very philosophical, you know, we could talk about the right to life. Everybody has a right to life. Even if you live in China, Chinese government doesn't, you know, protect their right to life, but still Chinese people have it. So we have this right to life. Well, the corollary to that is that you also have a right to self-defense. If you're walking down the sidewalk and somebody starts to choke you, do you have to call the chief of police to get permission to defend yourself? Do you have to whip out a letter from, oh, I don't know, maybe the governor of the state that says that you are authorized to fight back? I mean, are you really going to stop and get permission, or are you going to do whatever is necessary to, you know, make this person leave you alone? Well, when we talk about it, hypothetically, everybody will say, okay, sure, no problem. If the, if the danger is great enough, and you, you know, sincerely believe that the other person is attempting to kill you, then against all of our social uh, you know, if you, if you murder somebody, we, we tend to get pretty upset. You know, we're either going to put you to jail for the rest of your life or, you know, put a needle in your arm because it's just antisocial. You're not supposed to go around and hurt people. But we acknowledge, at least philosophically, that if somebody's hurting you that badly and you think that you're going to die, you actually have a justifiable right to kill them before they kill you. I mean, this is what the right to self-defense is all about. Now, people get nervous when they talk about it, but I've never met anybody who openly said, no, no, you're not allowed to fight back. All right? Well, there's a difference between talking about it philosophically and actually having it happen. You're in a dark alley, and somebody comes up and points a gun at you, you know, they want your your you know wallet or your purse. Okay, it's no longer hypothetical. I mean, this person is literally going to try to steal your money. And if you've got any wits about you at all, you'll know that if you give them your money, they're probably going to shoot you anyway because you can identify them. I mean, you know you could pull them out of a lineup and that they would go to jail. And so in most cases, you know, you hand them your wallet because they've promised 
not to hurt you. And it's like, guess what? They lied. You know, they're going to take your money. You don't think that lying about shooting you is, is a, even a possibility? So under the circumstances, as nasty and horrific and terrible as they are, if you want to stay alive, you need to pull out a gun or a weapon and kill them before they kill you. I mean, I'm sorry. I would wish that wouldn't happen. I wish that you know nobody would you know initiate violence in the first place. But you know, life is a harsh place. We don't live in a jungle. But if you live in Washington D.C. or New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, these are cities with drastic gun control. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I turn on the news, and they are telling me that. More than, well, you know, 24 people were murdered in 24 hours in the city of Chicago. All right? So what are you going to do when it stops being hypothetical? And see, people don't want to talk about it. It's too, it's just too much of a shock to the system. I mean, it's bad enough for some people to talk about it in theory, but to actually talk about you know, pulling the trigger and killing somebody else, they don't want to do that. And, well, I mean, your choice is to either defend yourself and kill kill the other person or, you know, hope that you had somebody lined up to do your eulogy. It, it, it's just, it's it must be very enjoyable for a student to be in your class to learn these things. And what I like about how you've written this book is that you, you lay out what the Constitution is, but in a simple way that even grade school children can understand exactly what it is you're talking about. Well, grade school children understand self-defense. Sure they do. <laughs> and what it's it, like to own something. <laughs> that's right. You know, a two-year-old's favorite word, mine. You know, it's mine. You know, we, we want it to be mine because then you control What's going to happen to the object? You know, if you you know, come across some children who have been, you know, fighting in the sandbox, the children never say, we weren't fighting. The first thing they say is, he started it. In other words, I was just defending myself. I have a legitimate reason for my use of force. And, and so... The Constitution is all about that. It's all about mine. It's all about owning property. It's all about he started it because I'm just defending myself. And as we get older, we, we you know, allow the governments and the schools to convince us that this is just never acceptable. You're never allowed to hurt another person. We just eschew violence and Oh my goodness! You know, you just you can't you can't even talk about the possibility of shooting and killing another person. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to sit around and let somebody else hurt me because you're squeamish, you know, about the use of violence. I mean, I have I have owned a gun for uh, 35 years never pointed it at anybody. Um, I hope I never have to point it at anybody. But I've whittled the Constitution and Bill of Rights down to seven words. I've tried to make it really, really easy for people. And the Constitution basically boils down to this. Don't hurt me. Don't take my stuff. Now, there's a parenthetical after that or I'll have to shoot and kill you. But that sounds that sounds so antisocial. You know, as long as you're not trying to hurt me and you're not trying to take my stuff, then you and I can be friends. You know, we can like different music, we can like different presidential candidates, we can disagree on everything else and still be friends. But if you try to hurt me or you try try to take my stuff, I will use, first of all, um, you know, intellectual debate. It's like, 
really, dude? <laughs> you think you're going to rip me off? <laughs> uh, and if that doesn't work, I'll try to you know stop you just by grabbing your hand or using non-lethal violence. But the bottom line is that ultimately you're not going to take my stuff. Mm-hmm. You're not going to hurt me. You're not going to take my stuff. And if I can't make you stop by talking to you about it, then yes, I will pull the trigger. And I very, very rarely miss. I can't help but be reminded of a comedian Ron White when he talks about the gun laws in Texas, that if you go and you kill somebody in the state of Texas, we will kill you right back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but, you know, it's interesting when you kind of put things on those terms and you realize, well, okay, geez, that really draws a line on the sand about how far you're allowing someone else to go. But, you know, that's one of the biggest debates going on out there. And, and you know, with these gun shootings, you know, heaven forbid, we've had quite a few of them here in the state of Oregon. And then, you know, you have people running out there, you know, uh, talking about these gun rights and constitutional, the Second Amendment, and then there's the NRA, and then you have this big mess going on here. But really it boils down to some real simplicity, doesn't it? It is. It's incredibly simple. I mean, I can't understand uh, in 2007, the Supreme Court ruled in Heller versus Washington, the United States, or Washington, D.C., excuse me, that the Second Amendment defends an individual right to keep and bear arms. I got a dozen phone calls before 7 o'clock in the morning. Michael, Michael, the Supreme Court voted 5 to 4 in favor of Ella. Like, so? So, well, we thought you'd be all excited because, you know, you're a Second Amendment guy. It's like, yeah. Do I have a right to life? Yes. Would I be all excited because the Supreme Court voted five to four in favor of my right to life? Does does my right to life depend on the Supreme Court voting in favor of it? What if the Supreme Court votes five to, uh, four to five against my right to life? Do I have to turn myself in, you know, for food processing? Right. No, I have a right to life, whether the Supreme Court recognizes it or not. They don't. They don't create my rights. They don't give me my rights. I have rights, and they've taken an oath to protect and defend them. Oh, by the way, and let me explain how that's supposed to work. So back to the, you know, Second Amendment. So I'm not excited because, you know, the Supreme Court voted five to four. That means there are four people on the Supreme Court who do not recognize my right to life and my right to defend myself with a gun if somebody's trying to hurt me or take my stuff. So, no, I'm not excited about the Heller decision. I'm not excited about the Supreme Court. They wouldn't recognize the Constitution if I wrapped the Constitution around a baseball bat and beat them with it. And and that's a recurring dream that I have. Now, there are many people who are excited, for whatever reason, uh, as we have the big marijuana debate and we're seeing now states who have legalized marijuana. Now, I find this to be really interesting uh, when you go back about 10 years, when there were particular states where there were dispensaries that were opened for uh, the distribution of legal medical marijuana. Now, even further, what was interesting, the state of California was uh, one of those states, is how the federal government would step in, literally seize the property, take all the, its contents and walk away. Now, here was somebody, a proprietor, that was operating within the letter of the law. He was granted that right, if you will, to do this. Now, what I found interesting is not too long after I had seen, I believe it was a news report on something like this, where I was actually in court on a traffic ticket, which I beat, by the way. It was uh, not surprising because of what the officer did. But anyway... 
Uh, the gentleman that stepped up after me had been arrested for possession of less than one ounce of marijuana. And he's standing there in front of the judge, and he says, Look, I said, I am legally entitled by the law of the state of Oregon, I've got my medical marijuana card right here in my hand, to be able to have this in my possession. Actually up to so much, but he had way less than that. And the judge was sitting there arguing with him. And I'm like, well, how do you argue with the law? <laughs> but this is the kind of stuff you just kind of leave you scratching your head. Well, look, if I'm playing by the law, according to the law, then what are you trying to punish me for? Well, see, therein lies the problem that most people have. You know, it's like, how do you, you know, argue with the law? Which law? Which law are you talking about? Are we talking about federal law, state law, you know, city ordinances? Are we talking about French law, Canadian law? I mean, you know, really, what law are you talking about? And one of my favorite scenes is from the movie um, Deliverance. Shortly after Burt Reynolds has shot the guy with the bow and arrow and his partner Drew is all upset, oh, my God, oh, my God, we killed somebody, we got it. You know, you know, got to, it's law. And Burt Reynolds goes, what law, Drew? What law are you talking about? They're out in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, it's literally the law of survival. You know, if, if you had civilized law out there in the middle of Georgia, I think it was where that movie was supposed to be, you would have had police officers there to kind of prevent the event from happening in the first place. But, you know, when you're out in the middle of nowhere and you are surviving on your own, in this case, you know, cruising down the river in a canoe, I mean, you have to bring your own food. You have to, you know, light your own fire. You've got to do your own self-defense. You know, there's no law that you can call on to, to protect you. So ultimately, your life, your survival, your self-defense, is your responsibility and part of what we go through. I don't I have time to spend a lot of, you know, discussion on it, but we do talk about different jurisdictions and what those jurisdictions mean. You know, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, meaning dry spaces, and admiralty law is law of the sea, you know, out there in the middle of all that water. Well, common law, law of the land, is about property. You know, you could put up a fence and say, okay, this property is mine. This is my farm. And we can understand that. But there's no property in the middle of the ocean. You can't put four buoys up and say, okay, this little spot of the ocean belongs to me, because the ocean is quite literally fluid. And so, just for practicality, you have to have a different set of rules while you are on the water. And that's about as far as I go with it, to you know, make you understand that right. you have to understand jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. You've, got to, you've got to figure out whose law is going to supersede who. And one of the things going on in the United States is the the lie that federal law trumps state law. Oh, I'm from the government. I'm here to help. And that, you know, um, you know, federal agents or FBI agents come in and they're just going to take over and take charge. (laughs) No. No, it doesn't work that way. All you have to do is look as far as the uh, Tenth Amendment. And, you know, if you understand what the Tenth Amendment says, you know, the states have more power than the federal government. The state can throw the federal government out of the state anytime it wants. But unfortunately, we've been suckered, or rather the states have been suckered, into accepting all of this federal money, and all that federal money comes with strings attached. 
you know, it, it's like, you know, being a, a boy toy or a kept woman. You find somebody who's really rich, and they're going to pay for, you know, all your food. You live in this luxurious mansion, and and then they say, well, okay, you have to, you know, go outside and wax the BMW. They go, well, gosh, I don't want to do that. Well, it doesn't really matter what you want. You know, you've accepted the terms of the agreement. You've accepted the fact that you're going to let somebody else with money take care of you, and you're no longer going to be responsible for your own survival. So now, guess what? You know, you don't get to make the choices and the decisions. You no longer get to be independent. You gave up your independence. You volunteered to let somebody else take care of you. You basically gave up the the right to make your own decisions, and now you've got to play by whatever rules are dictated to you by, you know, your, you know, sugar mama, your sugar daddy. Well, apparently the state of New York agrees with you when it comes to the fact that states do have more power than the federal government does because they're not allowing anybody to come in there from the federal government without permission. <laughs> so that's... Well, that, that's good news. I I am a somewhat skeptical. I'd like to yeah. see that on the 10 o'clock news before I believe it. But mm-hmm. um, it, it is true legally and on paper. But once again, the Constitution is only a piece of paper. It is only as good as the American public that is willing to enforce the Constitution. So if you don't know what the Constitution says, you know, don't come crying to me because, you know, the federal government is sending you, you know, tax forms every April. You know, it you gotta understand what this is all about and you've got to be willing to stand up and make it happen. And, you know, quite frankly, standing there and shaking your finger at the people in Congress and go, no, 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 you know, you shouldn't do that. It's like, yeah, right. You know, and like, what are you going to do about it? So the American people are going to have to realize that voting is pretty much a waste of your time. You know, the, the the people who are going to be elected have already been decided. And you really are not a part of that decision making process. You know, I hate to hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you need to wake up, smell the coffee, and and realize that the people in Washington are not doing anything in your best interest. Well, I know that many Americans are seeing that and sort of verbally expressing it, but you got to take the next step. And it's like in the movie An American President, where Michael Douglas says, "You know, America is hard. You really got to want it." And he's absolutely right, according to what we're talking about here today. And I know that people can discover more about this by visiting your website at constitutionpreservation.org and that you also conduct classes around the country. At certain times, they can discover more about that. And also pick up the book, Good to be King. Michael, I'd like to thank you for taking the time out to be on our program. I mean, there's so much more we can talk about here. I know we barely even scratched a surface, let alone the surface, and uh, would love to welcome you back on the program again because this is always such a great topic to motivate people to take better action once you're armed with the right kind of information. I would be happy to come back. Uh, at, at your discretion, just let me know what I can do. And, uh, you know, I don't want to – I want to wish people, you know, health, wealth, and prosperity, but you're, you're not going to get it by just sitting there and waiting for the government to hand it to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, watch that that sixth Rocky where he says, well, if you want to go out there and get what you're worth, go out and get it, but be willing to take the hits. (laughs) Sometimes you're going to take some big ones. (laughs) Yes. Yes, Michael, thank you again so much for joining us here on the program today. Okay, thank you so much. You have a great day. You bet. The book is Good to Be King. It's the foundation of our constitutional freedom. Pick it up, put it on your shelf, but more importantly, put it in your lap and read. Find out what it is you need to know. 
You can also discover more by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. You can also follow us on Twitter at Beyond50Radio as well as Facebook. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.